context of white supremacy, Gus T. Renegade and Justice in for another program uh, to share constructive information on what racism, white supremacy is, and how it works. Uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning in to the broadcast. Uh, it is Monday, May 2nd, 2011. Uh, we will hop right to it. Uh, joining us, uh, I believe this would be his 13th visit to the program, uh, author of the United Independent Compensatory Code System Concept and uh, the recently published uh, accompanying word guide, uh, Mr. Neely Fuller, Jr. Mr. Fuller, are you with us? I'm here. Outstanding. Good to hear from you as always, sir. Um, and again, thank you so much for being so generous with your time. I know uh, you do a lot of programs and have spent a lot of time and energy um, speaking about addressing the system of white supremacy. Uh, I wanted to start off what we were just kind of going over. Um, you said you were just watching the news uh, and you heard President Obama speaking uh, about uh, the reported uh, death of Osama bin Laden, and you said that, like everything else, fits into your view of white supremacy. Uh, what's your uh, your codified thoughts on the uh, alleged report of uh, Osama bin Laden's death? Well, the first, first reaction is it comes under the umbrella of the term Middle East. And uh, according to logic and according to substantial evidence within counter-racist logic, uh, this, anything that happens in the so-called Middle East, which is considered to be an artificial construct, possibly with the white supremacists having most, the most say-so in even constructing something called the Middle East. That's a construct. That's something made up. That's a term that was made up that applies uh, almost arbitrarily to a particular area of the world where there are a substantial number of non-white people, people classified as non-white. And there are other people there, people who are classified as white also, but it's an area of the world apparently that the white supremacists at some time or another had a lot of influence in establishing, and they gave it a label called the Middle East. And the label kind of shifts every now and then. I mean, to take in certain geographical areas, uh, according to what the maps that I've looked at, it constantly shifts. Depends on what the action is. And the, only the people who practice the system of white supremacy know why this is. But it's one thing that you can almost guarantee that it's a volatile area, and it's designed to be volatile. I mean, that was done on purpose. It's, to, it's designed to be, and you would come to this base, to that conclusion based on logic, it's to, designed to be a perpetual attention getter. In other words, so that whatever is going on in the rest of the world, I mean, at certain points, the white supremacists will hit a couple of buttons and say, okay, stop whatever you're doing we got a problem in the Middle East. And they are always the ones, or the usual suspects, who are making the problem. Because they had the problem planned, whatever it is. Sometimes it's in a matter of weeks. Sometimes it's a long range, a part of the long range uh, plot that may have gone back. They will use some elements that may have been hatched as, you know, 40, maybe 50, maybe 100 years ago. Whenever they start calling that area of the world the Middle East, that would be the genesis of it. Whenever that was, I don't know the pin, pin, pinpoint when that area of the world started being called the Middle East. But when the white supremacists got a hold of it, it became a part of the white supremacist agenda. And it's designed mostly to keep turmoil going and keep everybody's attention focused on the turmoil. And also as a little experiment for doing things to non-white people in a very sophisticated manner, trying out new techniques of doing things with them and or against them, manipulating this, manipulating that. Now, that is that should be, under the recommendation of counter-racist logic, something that people try to gain more and more understanding about. But you start with that premise that it's a white supremacist construct Either they are the ones who started it or they took an examination of it when other people start calling it that 
and say, I think we can use that. Use it for what? To maintain, expand, and refine the system of white supremacy. And we'll, we'll just use it as an experimental area for all kinds of things, particularly how to go about destroying people, how to go about confusing people, how to go about saying one thing and meaning another. And we will put it under the umbrella title of Middle East Conflicts because mostly that, that is what will perpetually be going on. A bunch of people who wander through there, a bunch of people who consider it as their, you know, their, their place where they should be and where other people shouldn't be. And just, just keep that pot boiling one way or another. Don't let it simmer. Don't let it calm down because you have a lot of people who are somewhat uh, gaining and growing intelligence in that area. Not just a bunch of people who just traditionally have just kind of milled around bumping into things, but beginning to gain some intelligence. So you have to watch them very closely and manipulate how they think and how they operate, but always see to it that they're always running behind, that they're always dumber than they think that they are. Keep them that way. That's the white supremacist's agenda what, for what is called the so-called Middle East. Always keep them more ignorant uh, uh, as compared to what they think that they are. When they think that they are really getting smart, then you feed that. You tell them that they are getting smart. You help them to believe that they are getting smart when all the time you are systematically making them more and more ignorant. And every now and then you prove their ignorance by doing things that astonishes them, that leave their mouths hanging open when they thought that they were making some so-called quote-unquote progress. Now, the white supremacists do this all over the world, but that's just one of the what you call the centerpieces, the experimental area. But one of the main things you can rely on, people will be dislocated, that's one of the main things, racial dislocation. And the thing that they do everywhere where they operate, the modern-day white supremacists, keep confusion going. Comes up, come up with all kinds of different scenarios for mass confusion. Keep people on the move and keep them confused. Don't let them get settled down where they have time to really do some serious in-depth thinking, long-range thinking. Keep them thinking short range. Uh, uh, steer their so-called traditions in a direction that's going in nowhere. And uh, use their own traditions against them. Find out how to steer that. Study them at all times. And uh, just keep that going. And uh, that that's my picture of, of that. Now, the classic or you might say the standard for addressing all situations like what's been going on, say, in the news for the last two or three weeks, particularly with the so-called uprisings and all like that. There's a standard codified saying for that. Uh, and it would apply not just to so-called Middle East situations. It'll apply anywhere at any time where people who shouldn't be harmed are being harmed. That's any people who shouldn't be harmed. Some people should be harmed. But the people who shouldn't be harmed are being harmed if they're classified as non-white and shouldn't be harmed. I mean, they're not doing anything except just they just happen to be where they are. And all it takes is one. And that kicks in the codified position on the entire area. If just one person who shouldn't be harmed is harmed, and that person is classified as non-white, that automatically kicks it into the suspicion of the white supremacists being at work. All it takes is just one person, one person out of million, out of millions. If one person just falls off a bicycle and hits their head while some shelling is going on, and that person is officially classified as a non-white person, that means that the white supremacists are to be blamed for everything going on in the entire area of harm coming to someone who should not have been harmed. So it goes according to these four things. 
many people have been harmed who should not have been harmed. That's number one. Number two, many people are to blame. Number three, the people who are most to blame are hiding in plain sight, meaning they may, most of them, most of them will be nowhere near what we call the Middle East physically. But they'll be orchestrating everything by remote control, thousands of miles away sometimes, sometimes far, sometimes near, sometimes somewhere in between. But they are the people who are most to blame. The people who are most to blame are hiding in plain sight. There's people who are just kind of walking around. And if you talk to them about Middle East, some of them being so deceptive like they are, they're experts at that, will say, Middle East, exactly, what is that? Or is that somewhere around Arabia or someplace like that? I mean, that's the way they will talk in just what you might call coffee table conversation. But some of these people are masters at manipulating everything is going on in the place that you are talking about and trying to get them to understand, and they know everything about it. That's what I mean by hiding in plain sight. There's someone standing around a coffee machine, and they would give the impression that they wouldn't know where the Middle East is supposed to be. They would probably name New Hampshire when talking to someone because they know how to act. They're great actors and actresses. That's some of them. And then some of them, of course, call themselves experts and they give out all kinds of false information. And they are experts. That's why they can give false information. Because to be an excellent non-truth teller, you have to know what the truth is. But let's get back to the fourth one. Well, I'll, I'll reiterate, the, uh, repeat the third one. The people who are most to blame are hiding in plain sight. In other words, they're not somewhere in some cave somewhere and all like that. They might go in some underground something or another, I mean, you know, to, to fire some mysterious weapon or spread some kind of disease or something like that. Because they have these places, too. The white supremacists operate everywhere, all over the world, all the time, 24-7. And then the fourth one is, the people who are most to blame are all white supremacists. And you have just four things to say, and it will apply to a number of situations. Many people have been harmed who should not be harmed, number one. Number two. Many people are to blame. Number three, the people who are most to blame are hiding in plain sight. Number four, the people who are most to blame are all white supremacists. That's every person who believes in and who practices the system of white supremacy, they are to blame. Not necessarily pinpointed for a particular incident, but collectively, they are to blame because they form a world army, the most powerful army the world has ever seen. The smartest and most powerful people that the world has ever known are the people who believe in and who practice white supremacy against the non-white people of this planet in all nine areas of activity, economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war, and they dominate what non-white people do in all of these areas of activity 24-7, but they are very deceptive in the way they go about doing it, and it looks like they don't even exist in many places in the world. When you talk to non-white people, they say, white supremacy, what is that? I know something about colonialism, neo-colonialism, but what, what's this thing, mysterious thing that organization or whatever it is that you call white supremacy. Well, it's not an organization as such. It's an entire system. It's a world system of domination based on one premise. Mistreat people based on their color. The color that is other than white. That's it. 
That's the purpose of it. It serves no other purpose. It has no other destiny. It has no other destination. That's it. And you do it in all kinds of ways, in all areas of activity, and the purpose of it overall, ultimately, is it's its own value. Sometimes people may say, what is the purpose of white supremacy? The purpose of white supremacy is white supremacy. End of story. That's the purpose. Mistreat people based on the color of the people and enjoy doing it. Doesn't get any better than that. And come up with newer and better ways of doing it to keep it interesting. That's what it's for. In simple language, it's a very simple formula, but it's the most powerful idea ever thought up by anybody for controlling and dominating people. Context of white supremacy, Mr. Neely Fuller Jr. Uh, make sure you share the program on uh, Twitter, Facebook, let people know uh, Mr. Fuller is on. And uh, yeah, I think it would be constructive if more non white people were able to hear this program. Uh, I wanted to uh, hop to your first publication, uh, The Code Book. Uh, this is on page 65. Uh, you say uh, this is uh, under education. Try to learn something about everything. Take an interest in everything that happens and in everything that exists in the universe. Reason explanation. All people, both white and non-white, have persons among them who have great knowledge and understanding of many, many things. But non-white people do not consolidate and constructively utilize and efficiently exchange the variety of things that they learn from time to time. They do not record and store what they learn. They allow what they learn to filter away. They do not pass on constructive information willingly, deliberately, constantly, and efficiently to those who need it most. This is one of the reasons much of what non-white people once knew was lost and or forgotten. Uh, I just wanted you to elaborate uh, on the reasons and explanations. Yes, all people uh, among even a family, I'll give that as an illustration, all of the people on the planet say a family or a tribe or whatever people want to call it, a little group of people that's wandering around in the woods. Maybe it's just maybe five people. There's going to be one person in that five who knows a little bit more about the environment or they begin to learn about the environment that they are in, and they will be kind of ahead of the other people in doing so. It just kind of works that way. I mean, that's an... Uh, you might have a family of 10 people. You've got one person who is pretty good when it comes to auto mechanics. And then you have another person who's sort of a bookworm and whatnot, and uh, they know a whole lot of things when it comes to maybe uh, uh, studying a variety of things. I mean, they don't know too much about any one thing, but they know a little bit about almost everything. And his name might be Everett, you know. So everybody in the family, all the ten people, they say, well, ask Everett about that. He knows a little bit about that. You're talking about planting asparagus. I mean, he did a little of it one summer because he's always tinkering around with not. So he might know a little bit. Of, you know, I don't know anything about it. I do carpentry work. Now, that's Carl talking, but Everett is the person that you see if you're going to start, start talking about asparagus. Now, the entire world is that way. In fact, there's an old proverb. Some people say, it's a quote-unquote African proverb. He who does not know one thing knows another. And so everybody kind of knows something or has the potential for knowing something. See, everybody has some value of some type. You know, a person uh, who is in a wheelchair uh, might not be able, and obviously not, to uh, be a linebacker on a football team. But that person may make an excellent football coach. Oddly enough, a person in a wheelchair 
who's never played football. But they can look at the plays and all like that and become an ardent student of the plays. And uh, many people know people who know people who know people throughout, you know, the beginning of time, I guess, who can understand the, that basic concept that everybody might know a little bit of something more than the next person standing next to them at any given time. And then there are some people who know a lot of things and know them, you know, very, very well. Some t sometimes people call them geniuses and whatnot. But then on something, and they can do very complicated things. They can work uh, mathematical equations that are extremely complicated that the average person has no idea of what they're doing. And then on something else, like driving a car, might be the worst driver. You never want to get in the car with them because they just simply can't drive, even though they're you know, on paper and whatnot and figuring out how to do architectural drawings and how to put up a building that is solid and that will stay there and, and have an excellent foundation and all like that and what materials to use. They are whiz at it. But put them under the wheel of a car or sometimes maybe even a bicycle, and they fall off of it, you know. He who does not know one thing knows another. And maybe the universe is deliberately set up that way. Why? It's logical to think that it's set up that way because it keeps people from being too arrogant, hopefully. However, people do have a tendency to be arrogant. They learn a few things, and then they begin to get arrogant toward the people who didn't learn those same things. And that causes a lot of problems. But even the smartest person in the world will become a person who is not so smart, nowhere near as smart as they were years earlier. And we see this in what we call senility. If you keep getting up in the morning and going to bed at night, everybody begins to learn a little something about that. Or if they see someone else who keeps getting up in the morning and going to bed at night, and if they do it long enough, even the smartest person in the world will become very inefficient at doing what they have been doing best. And that's think. Because why? The mind begins to wear out just like the body. And a person who once could do all kinds of mathematical equations, if you put five cents on the table, they would have no idea of what they're looking at if they stay here on the planet long enough. And that's a lesson in that. Don't be arrogant about what you know. When you know it and you are efficient at it, try to pass it on to other people and do so in a manner that has a constructive effect. A constructive effect. Now, that's the effect you want it to have. You just don't pass on information, and then when the information is used, it's used non-constructively, or it's used in a deceptive manner. It's used in a manner to uh, help to promote arrogance and cause a person to become overbearing and all like that. So no amount of learning by anybody, white or non-white, should be used in this manner. What happened, the white supremacists became very, very smart for whatever reasons they had in the beginning, and then they became arrogant about being smart. And then they began to use what they knew and what they had learned to mistreat people. And then they start, started, presumably, mistreating each other and having fun doing it. And then when they caught on to the idea of producing something called racism and they started classifying people according to color, then they just took off and started being real arrogant on a huge scale. And it has poisoned the entire world and kept all people, white and non-white, from being the quality of people that all people should be in this wonderful universe that we have been given because it's all a gift. We didn't do anything to earn being here on this planet. 
with all the leaves on the trees and the crops growing and the water flowing and the sun in the sky and the moon coming by and things, I mean, more or less operating in some type of balance until arrogant people start messing with stuff, contaminating the water, contaminating the food, and going around pretending that they created something, which there's nobody who can honestly, correctly, and truthfully claim that they created anything. People do not create anything. People arrange things that have been created already, created by what? A creator. What is a creator? A force that makes something out of nothing. You can't find an inventor anywhere. They claim that they made an invention out of nothing. They arranged what was already here. Um, I want to definitely... Uh get your thoughts on this because someone just uh, wrote this section from the code book on uh, their Facebook page and when I read the code book uh, some years ago for the first time uh, this was one of the most profound things that stood out to me I would never thought about this and you know it has stuck with me since um, this is on page 66 still under education uh, from the code book uh, you write <coughs> Racists do not discard records simply because they have no current use for the information contained in them. They do not destroy or allow to decay any records of information simply because they have not been used in a long time. They keep them, re-examine them, and develop newer uses for them. Non-white people, however, generally are not interested in learning about everything and or in keeping detailed records about all things. Non-white people generally have no great desire to know everything there is to know about the universe. They have no great desire to dominate the universe and all that is in it, or a part of it. They are mostly content to survive in it. The lack of interest by no, most non-white people in doing anything other than surviving in the universe explains why non-white people lack the will to keep themselves from being dominated by white supremacists. The white supremacists encourage their subjects to limit their interests and desires to nothing more constructive than survival, while permitting and encouraging non-white people to concern themselves mostly with survival from day to day and year to year. The racists continue to improve their own ability to think and to explore and to develop greater and more efficient means of dominating non-white people. They seek more non-white people to dominate as they travel through the unknown. Though most non-white people do not understand the thoughts and desires of those white persons who practice white supremacy, they are generally not opposed to being subjected, excuse me, subjugated by them as long as they can survive and be allowed to acquire a degree of food, clothing, and housing that prevents them from becoming extinct uh, and just connecting that to, to really flush it out uh, this idea which as I said was one of the uh, this was one of the biggest things uh, that stuck out to me in reading the book um, this is on page 70 still under still under education uh, all people should learn about all of the mistakes that were made by all people 
who existed before them. They should learn about all of the things that should not have been done by people in all areas of activity. This includes the areas of economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war. The mistake that most non-white people made upon contact with white people was to submit to and cooperate with people who were very smart but who had no intentions of doing justice. The non-white people, for the most part, showed that they were willing to submit to injustice. If by doing so, if by so doing, they would be allowed to survive. They did so because of their ignorance of the importance of justice. Any people who value survival more than justice do not understand that survival without justice is valueless. Any people who do not know the value of justice are an extremely ignorant people. This mostly pertains to black and or non-white people. I just wanted you to uh, share your thoughts, the importance of justice uh, and why survival without justice is valueless. Well, when I say valueless, that means it is of less value than survival. Uh, you know, uh, black people are very content, a little bling bling and whatnot. And uh, really, I mean, they don't put a lot of emphasis on either justice or survival, which is what you will eventually get. If you're just thinking about survival, you will eventually devalue even survival. And you will show that by being willing to kill or to die. Uh, black people have a tendency to show intense interest in uh, funerals, for one thing. Black people, more than, you know, if, if, if you've got to be serious when it comes to a funeral. If black people are getting ready to have a funeral, they get real serious about a funeral. They almost like they worship funerals, look forward to funerals. Funerals, is, are, you know, represent the other side of survival. See, but you can you only, you know, while a person is here and struggling and needs some help and whatnot, I mean, well, they might give you a little lip service. They might give you a, a little help to kind of take you along up to a point and whatnot. But there's not that burning intense interest to have justice, meaning help the person who needs help the most. But if the person happens to die, oh, then people come from Hilda and Yon. They will spend money that they wouldn't ordinarily have spent and travel thousands of miles to do what? To go to the funeral. And this is why we've gotten to the place we almost look forward to the gunshots in the night where the next day we can run out and buy some candles and get some teddy bears and then hug each other in front of the fence where the killing occurred and talk about RIP and write it on all the walls throughout the neighborhood. Willie Simpson, RIP, my good friend. I'll always remember him. Sue Johnson. R.I.P. She was a sweet child with a wonderful smile. I have many pictures of her. And we'll all go down and hang them on the fence. Because we love anything that has to do with death. And we do not protest the people who do the killing. We are not serious about we're doing a real job on the people who do the killing, white and non-white, which is something that should be extremely rare 
by now, as long as people have been on this planet. People killing people, usually about utter nonsense. And black people worship that type of thing, too. Any kind of killing about nothing. Real serious about that. And waiting to break out in tears at a funeral. Because there's just something magical about a funeral. A body in a casket that can no longer breathe, no longer move, no longer do anything except rot. But we'll make sure, go to no, hold back no expense. We'll give that person a nickel when they were breathing. But we'll really contribute to the funeral. That is a form of monumental sickness. And it's planted in our heads by the white supremacists more than anybody. Wow. Um, if you could uh, just share why you say uh, in the code book that uh, any people who do not know the value of justice are an extremely ignorant people. Uh, this mostly pertains to black and or non-white people. Yes. Because we'll just go along to get along. I mean, and don't 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 go around waking up like we should in a non-just world, thinking about justice all the time, thinking about black people, how we interact with each other in in that mistreatment mode that's been planted in us and carried on from generation to generation. Some of us even bragging about being killers and want to tattoo ourselves with words like I'm a thug or the thug life and I want to go to my grave with that tattooed on me because that's a wonderful thing and I want to pass on that message to all the younger people coming behind me be a thug live fast die young and have a beautiful corpse it came out of a movie in the 1940s about a character named Nick Romano, I think. Live fast, die young, and have a beautiful corpse. Looking forward to it. Totally sick people. The people that a person from another planet or a creature from another planet should be warned about. Stay away from anybody who thinks like that. It's not productive, that's why. It's not constructive. Everything in the universe is either constructive or non-constructive. Black people have been led to believe that non-constructive activity is wonderful in every area of activity. Just make sure that it is not going to be constructive. It's going to be non-constructive. It's going to be a waste of time, a waste of energy and a waste of people. And that's what we should embrace. Sing songs about it. Write songs about it, Being destructive. Looking forward to it. Wishing for it. Making plans for it. Comes out of the minds of the white supremacists and they pass it on to us. The victims of white supremacy. As the best thing that we can do with the wonderful existences that we all have been given. Eyes, nose, hands, fingernails, legs, a brain. And the white supremacy said, yes, use it. Use it to glorify destruction. That's what I like to teach. That's what I like to do. And I want you to pick up on it and embellish it among yourselves, particularly when it comes to killing. Don't kill me, even though I teach you how to do it. Kill your brother and the fellow down the street. And anybody who remotely looks like you, kill it. Kill it. Harm it. Kick it. Curse it. Write a song about kicking it and killing it and cursing it. 
and try to get everybody to listen to it. And then go out and do it and try to get them to do it. And call that our culture. Isn't that wonderful? I wish somebody would copy it. Everybody should be like that. Mass sickness. That's what the system of white supremacy spawns. You have done an excellent job. Even as we speak, it manifests itself all over the world. Get me a nine millimeter and kill somebody that looks like me. That's what I do. That's the mind of a stone victim. A person who has com been completely victimized because their mind has been completely turned upside down, inside out, and then finally just completely oblivious. It's not even a mind. Robotized. Niggerized. A thing. Not even remotely resembling a humane person, a human being. All nine years of activity, this is what the white supremacists enjoy. They have made the world a cesspool of this nonsense. Some areas of the world, people don't have the sophisticated pistols and rifles, so get a machete. Don't cut bananas off the tree or cut sugar cane. Get a machete and whack off the arm of a black lady who tried to hide from you because you're a rapist. Teach her a lesson. And then walk around and feel proud of yourself. Strong black male image. We can stop it by becoming a little bit sane in this insane situation that's been produced and refined by the white supremacists. Context of white supremacy. Uh, my co-host Justice is also with us, and I think she has some questions. Uh, I did want to get in uh, my my Ralph Ellison moment, uh, Mr. Fuller. I think he began uh, his response uh, talking about how we love death and love funerals. Uh, necrophilia, that's <laughs> Langston Hughes' Invisible Man, begins with that, and uh, he just said, uh, "You become uh, robotized." That is. That is invisible man. That's the whole thing. You just become mechanical, not even a person anymore. Justice, if you have some questions for Mr. Fuller, your line is open. Uh, uh, let me make sure your line is open. Uh, please feel free. Um, hello, Mr. Fuller. Um, I have a few questions. Um, what was your purpose of writing the word guide? Purpose of write, writing the word guide is to reveal to the readers, uh, the people who are victims of racism, that the glue, you might say, quote, unquote, that holds the system of white, su white supremacy together in the modern day is words, how they use words, how they define words, and that there are many words that make no sense at all. There are a lot of words that would make sense if they were given correct definitions. But some words are given very confusing definitions. Or the definitions are really not definitions. They're just descriptions of something very abstract that you cannot apply. And the white supremacists do this deliberately. One of the key words, and this word has just been used, I mean, uh, uh, very explicitly in the last 24 hours. And that's the word justice. It's a word that, you know, it, it's an excellent thing if it's given a definition. The word justice does not have a clear definition worldwide, an agreed-upon definition. So I tried to give it a compensatory definition. And uh, I started off calling it balance between people, but then I knew that I had to embellish it a little bit more because that might lead 
to too much more confusion. This balance between people, what does that mean? And so it calls for more a further explanation. So I tried to give a more explicit one, one that's more definitive, one more that's clearer, one that's focused, and it's in two parts. Part one, guaranteeing that no person is mistreated. Part two, guaranteeing that the person that needs help the most gets the most constructive help. And that's anywhere, at any time, in any circumstance. Keep that in mind. Always raise the question. Start with the question. Is anyone here being mistreated? If so, we want to know who that someone is. What the nature of the mistreatment is. Who is causing the mistreatment? And, last but not least, what can be done about it? And then the part two is, once you ascertain who's being mistreated, evidently the person who is being mistreated will probably need help the most. If you got five people in a room and only one person at that particular setting is getting, you know, mistreatment that cannot be handled, cannot be addressed, that's being harmed the most, so that person who is being harmed the most needs the most constructive help. So you have five people in the room, so you, you go to the person who needs help the most. And the first thing you ascertain is, what help do you need? And make sure that the help is constructive. If the person needs some help in distributing drugs or something like that, cocaine or something like that, then that's not constructive help. That's why I underline the word constructive in many cases. Constructive help. The person will say, yeah, I need some more help. I mean, I ran out of money and I can't. I can't get my supplier. My supplier is looking for me to come up with some more money, so I need to borrow some money from grandmother so I can go and pay him off so I can get me some more cocaine. Otherwise, he's not going to let me have no more. Well, that's an operation that is not constructive. So you don't help the person at all in doing that. No way. And uh, But if they're doing something constructive or trying to do something constructive, that's the person that should be helped by everybody who is able to do so. And uh, that's just one word, the word justice. But then you have uh, hundreds of other words, I mean, like the word America, the word African. Now, I understand that on President Obama's father's, uh, President Obama's birth certificate, where his father was listed by race as African. Now, in the latest census, I don't think that, that is, you have African-American, but I don't think that there's any race of people named African, an African race. And really, according to what I have written, after studying all the different classifications by race that have been put out here by various sources, I came up on the one that I think will stand the test of time and the one that's truthful and accurate. And that is when you start talking about race, you're talking about one race, and that is the white race. Under the name, official or unofficial, you might say, or most popular phrase, white supremacy. Why do I say this? If you're a member of the white race, you're a white supremacist. And why do I say that? It's because the only purpose for being a member of a race is to practice racism. And the only form of racism on this planet that's worthy of paying any attention to whatsoever is racism in the form of white supremacy, which means mistreating people based on color. That's all being a member of a race is for. But now when you look at all kinds of literature, all kinds of classification books and whatnot, other authors will say that's not what race is at all. I mean, you know, everybody should be proud to be a member of a race. But when you look at it logically, you start raising questions. Proud to be a member of a what? Well, a race. Be a member of a race and be proud of it for what reason? What is the purpose of a race? Well, it, uh, it's a group of people that get together to do things. Do things like what? Oh, well, all kinds of things and whatnot. No, 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 no. You can be a member of all kinds of organizations and do things to accomplish things. So what do you accomplish when 
you are going to be or aspire to be or join a member of a quote unquote race. What are you joining a race for? Because a race is something that you join. How well, did you put? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, well, I was just going to say this. So when you join a race, logically speaking, and you think about it for a little while because it may, may require a little thought, why am I joining a race? Why am I proud to be a member of a race? The only purpose, see, a race has a purpose, and the only purpose for being a member of a race of people is to practice what? Racism. And the only reason for practices, practicing racism is to mistreat someone based on color. That's all it's good for. That all, that's all it ever was good for. Black people, non-white people, were never members of a race. They were told that they were members of a race. By whom? By the race makers. And whom are they? White supremacists. They're the usual suspects. How did you put the United Areas of People activity together? Say that again. How did you put the United Areas of People activity together? The, the United Areas? The Nine Areas of People activity? Um, how did you put Oh, the, the Nine Areas. The Nine Areas of People activity. Oh, well, the yeah. first four... Uh, I paraphrase, the first four came off of my uh, progenitors, you might say father, off of his tombstone. I think he had industry, the law, religion, and one other that I sometimes forget. Uh, uh, but it was four of them. He had four categories there. And I know that industry was one. I, I changed the word industry to economics. But he, he, I do remember he had religion and law. Now, this was on his tombstone. If I ever can find his tombstone again, I mean, uh, that's the only way that I, uh, somebody tells me where it is. Uh, because the graveyard where he was buried, I think, has been finally gone to siege, you might say. And uh, a lot of the tombstones have been misplaced and all like that. But I remember uh, after he passed, this was on his tombstone, and he had also talked to me about it. He called it the Four Principles of Life. That's how he named it. But later on, I applied it under economics, religion, law, and then I put them in alphabetical order, and I, decided, I came up with nine categories. Some people said I should have added health, uh, but I say that if you are doing what you should do in those nine, you have health because health means a whole number of things. There are a lot of things connected with your health. You have to have so-called economic health, educational health, legal health, political health, religious health. See, it all comes under health because you are healing. You know, that's what health, the base word for health is healing. So you're, you're doing compensatory work. You're doing repair work. So that's how those nine areas were basically formed. I just put them in alphabetical order. I came up with nine. Uh, I was thinking about adding some more, but then I didn't want to just keep adding and adding and adding. Uh, I thought that the nine would, would work, and so far I think they do. They cover just about everything that everybody is doing, one or more of, they're operating in one or more of those areas of activity somewhere on the planet or in outer space or wherever they happen to be. That's why I call it the nine areas of people activity. You know, everybody's engaged in one or more of those areas, and all of these areas are interactive. What happens in the field of religion affects what happens in the field of law. What happens in the field of law affects what happens in the, in the area of politics. What happens in the area of politics will affect what happens in the area of war. What happens in the area of war will affect what happens in the area of education, and on and on and on. All of the areas of activity, just like parts of a person's body, 
one interacts with the other. The heart is not separate from the kidneys. I mean, they're two different organs, but they, they have to work somewhat in concert with one another in order for the body to work. When you start getting one thing out of order, then other things start breaking down too. It's the same way with the nine areas of activity. The white supremacists understand this. This is why they will get control of one area of activity among a tribe of people, like their laws, or like their politics, or like their religion, or like their sexual activity. All they need is control of one area. And because once they get control of one area, they'll get control of the rest of the areas. It'll be easier because all of them are connected. That's the logic, and that's what the evidence has shown. Is there any of is, is there any other words um, that you can think of that you can put um, in the word guide? If so, what are they? Is there what now? Is there any other words that you can think of that you can put in the word guide? If so, what are they? Oh, uh, oh, any numbers of them. I, I haven't think of, thought of anything recently, but I try to keep up. And uh, I think that people, when they read the Word Guide, they should make up list of words that are not in the Word Guide and uh, that they think are important. See, it, it's all addressed to the individual, like everything in the uh, Compensatory Code Book and the Word Guide. And if you run across words that are not in there because... Uh, it's, it was no way for me to put all words in the word guide that are in, you might say, a real comprehensive dictionary or any comprehensive word guide that's already on the shelves. I've seen dictionaries and word guides of some type, some type of word guide under different names and whatnot, that a person, one person could not carry the book. They would have to have two people carry it, and the book would be so huge. So uh, any word guide is just a sort of synopsis, even the ones that are, would weigh very much. I mean, one that would weigh maybe 300, 400 pounds, uh, a book that would weigh that much, and nothing in it but words and definitions and how to use words and the root causes of the words and all like that. I mean, these would be huge books, but even those books, would not carry all of the words because languages keep expanding and they keep changing. So in a compensatory fashion, I just tried to pick out some of the words in order for people to get the idea of how words are being used or can be used to counter racism and or to produce a product called justice because all words are tools. You know, so you try to shape your tools in such a way that you can accomplish the job that you're trying to do, just like a hammer or a nail or anything. All words are the same way. They're just tools that you pick up to use to do a job. And uh, I try to come up with some words that have come to my attention that I think need to be tailored and used in such a way that they do the job that words should do. That is, to have people behave in the manner that people should that would produce the most constructive results. The white supremacists use all of their words in a manner that either directly or indirectly supports the system of white supremacy. And that's evil, because the system of white supremacy is an evil system. So you want to counter that. By coming up, you can use the same words, but you give them compensatory definitions so that you make the words fashion these tools in a manner that they will do the job that words, all words, should do, and that is result in a constructive activity, have a constructive effect on the way that people think and speak and act, thought, speech, and action. And uh, I have some words, uh, like I said, in answer to the question, I can't think of any words right now, right off, offhand, that uh, 
that I would put in there, but probably within 15 or 20 minutes of just reading through a newspaper, I would probably uh, find at least five or six words that could be in there because I would think that maybe these words need to be thought about in the way that the words are used. Um, maybe they should be thought about and thought about in a different way from the way that they're used. Many words can be used the way that they always use. They have to reveal truth and they have to do something of constructive value. But many words do not do this. One word that seems to be constantly mentioned by many people in this area of the world, world is the word America. Without anyone sitting down and say, let's really discuss this word and what it really means, what it should mean. Absolutely, not in some abstract form. There's even a song, I believe, that puts the word America in the form of a question. What is America to me? Now, I would think that you should drop that to me and just simply ask, what is America? When is a person qualified to be an American? But first of all, what is an American? In all nine areas of activity, what does an American do that other people don't do? And be able to very specifically say what these, what an American does that other people do not do. Otherwise, what's the point in being an American if you're doing what everybody else is doing all over the world? If you're lying and cheating and stabbing people in the back and killing, gossiping. I mean, you don't have to be an American to do that. If you're bragging about killing someone, is that a characteristic of an American? Should that be included? If you kill someone, you step on their chest and brag about having done it? Like someone who is in a Roman circus in the Colosseum? In ancient days, you slay someone, a gladiator, and then put your foot on the gladiator's chest after you cut off his head and look up at the crowd and everybody cheers and say, boy, that was fun. That was wonderful. He should have been dead anyway, and I'm enjoying seeing people die. Now, Maybe that shouldn't qualify a person to be in a, uh, what you call an American. That should be qualified under the heading, according to logic, of improving things, of saying no. That's not the American way. Even when it's necessary to kill someone, you don't have a parade about it. You don't cheer the death of anyone. You consider that to be a tragedy. Because somebody is dead that once was a little baby that came in this world and took a turn for whatever, under whatever circumstances, that did not work out, and the person became dangerous, person or persons, and the only way to deal with it was to exterminate the person. But even in doing that, you don't even kill a rabbit and brag about having done so. That's a sickness. We need to get that ingrained in our skulls in order to maybe qualify for the title of American or African or Asian. Because I put it in my book. I gave these words definitions. African, Asian, American. It's in the word guide. And they are all the same. And what is that same? They are people, first of all, who do justice. So, you look around for someone who does justice, which means guaranteeing that no person is mistreated, and guaranteeing that the person that needs help the most gets the most constructive help. You don't find anyone on this planet who qualifies for any one of those terms. American, African, or Asian. No one qualifies 
Why? Based on evidence. What evidence? Justice doesn't exist. You don't have any place on this planet where, considering the entire planet, no one is being mistreated. Because that's what the qualification is. If you're going to be an American or an African or an Asian, you have to guarantee that no one is being mistreated. That's a guarantee, not a wish. And you have to guarantee that the person who needs help the most gets the most constructive help. Now, everyone should be doing all that he and she can. Every male, every female, every person should be doing all that he or she can do to become an American, an African, and an Asian. And you might call that person or persons universal man, universal woman, and our universal people. Why? Because we're in the universe. And we are qualified now to be in the universe because we are doing what we should do, guaranteeing that no one is mistreated and guaranteeing that the person that needs help the most gets the most constructive help in all areas of activity at all times. And that's what everybody should be trying to qualify for. Otherwise, we shouldn't be going around sticking out our chest saying we are qualified for any one of those three titles because we are not. So if you don't have Americans, you don't have Africans, and you don't have Asians, what do you have according to what I've written, the code? These are just suggestions. It's not doctrines, but they're suggestions of the way to improve. Well, what we do have are white people, non-white people, and white supremacists. And none of them are fit to be called American, African, or Asian, because none of them are doing justice. But every one of them, including myself, should be aspiring, should be doing everything you can to qualify for the title of American, Asian, African, which means universal man, universal woman, as far as we know it, as far as where we can function with some degree of efficiency. We should be universal people because we're in the universe. That's everybody, white and non-white. But all oh, no, we have settled in the being white supremacists for the most part, those people who are classified as white who have chosen to be white supremacists, mistreating people based on color, and they're victims. And you can't be a victim of white supremacy and practice justice simply because you're a victim. You're helpless in that, in that way. You have to stop being a victim in order to finally, hopefully, produce a product called justice. And, of course, the white supremacists themselves are dedicated to being non-just people. They are 100% opposed to justice. They do not believe in a situation or a world or a universe in which no one is being mistreated. They are dedicated to being mistreators, mistreaters. They are dedicated to that. And they certainly don't want to help people who need help the most. They want to laugh at them actually put them in a position where they are helpless and then laugh at them being helpless. Have a parade about it. In the word guide, and I believe it is in the compensatory cult system concept, you say there is no stupid or silly question. Why and how can there not be a silly or stupid question? There is no such thing as a silly question and or a stupid question simply because every question, according to logic, has an answer. The very fact that a question exists means that the question is not stupid and or silly. Every question in the universe has an answer because everything in the, that, that is done in the universe that is of any value whatsoever starts with a question. 
and the question may sound silly compared to other questions. The question may sound valueless or quote-unquote stupid, but the very fact that the question exists means that there is an answer to that question somewhere, even if the answer is, I don't know, which is the answer to most questions in the minds of most people throughout the planet. Most people do not know anything close to what they should know because the universe is vast and we know very little about the universe and we know very little about ourselves in the universe and we know very little about ourselves as persons, as individual persons. I look at my hand periodically and I take my hand and make a fist. And then I open my fingers, you might say, so that it's no longer a fist. And I can do this simply by thinking about it. Now, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. I can sit right here or stand somewhere and do this anytime I decide to do it. Open and close my hand with my fingers. They call it making fists. Close your hand. Open your hand close your hand, open your hand, or close your eyes. I can do that. Close your eyes, then open your eyes. Sometimes I might be asked, like going to a doctor, to inhale. So I inhale. Say, okay, inhale, now hold your breath. I can hold my breath. I do this by sending signals from what they say is my brain. But if you ask me how the details of all of that works, have me be able to describe in detail what every vein is doing, every so-called molecule is doing in my body at that very second, at that very split second that I decide to close one eye and keep the other one open. I can do that. But how I do it, I am completely ignorant, even though I'm doing it. I have no idea of how I do this. So now that should start every person to really thinking seriously about how much he or she does not know. Just that alone. Just start with yourself. How much you really don't know. Oh, some doctor might describe it on a chart and whatnot. But the doctor doesn't really know. He can only go so far, or she, and say, well, uh, it's, it's moved by nerves. And you say, okay, well, how does the nerve move? Where does the nerve get its power? I mean, your heart is beating even when you're asleep. Well, what keeps the heart beating? Well, the blood flow. Well, what keeps the blood flowing? Well, the heart keeps the blood flowing. Well, what makes the blood flow through the heart that keeps the blood flowing through the heart? And what makes the heart keep the blood flowing through the heart? And what is the origin of the blood that makes the heart flow? At some point, everybody who is telling the truth will say, I don't know. In order for me to tell you that, I would have to tell you the origin of the universe. And I don't know that. I can guess. I can imagine. I can pray on it. I can read books on it, but I really don't know. Because to know the origin of even one thing, one grain of sand, the actual origin, I mean back before that grain of sand was something called nothing. Do you know the origin of nothing? Maybe that answers some questions. Um, and I hope. But I'm saying, basically, that's why I came to the conclusion there's no such thing as a stupid question. Just because you don't have an answer doesn't say that the question is stupid. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Fuller, for um, answering um, some of my questions. Um, I do have more, but um, I'm going to save them later. Um, thank you so much. Go ahead, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you context of white supremacy uh folks that are listening you uh can subscribe uh to uh the site at talks you that way you'll get the reminders and updates 
uh, when we'll broadcast, because sometimes we'll be broadcasting here uh, and not at Blog Talk, and others will be simulcasting. So I would say uh, go ahead and uh, sign up for TalkShoe. That way you can get the updates, and you'll know when we have guests like Mr. Fuller on the program. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to uh, ask, because you have in the code book um, that, well, I'll read it, <laughs> and then I'll, I'll tell folks why I'm sharing this. Um, this is on page 71. Uh, you said that uh, while trying to learn, non-white people should not hesitate to ask white people, including white supremacists, to help them. They should ask for this help even if they know that white supremacists do not intend to help their victims do anything of constructive value. They should ask for the simple reason that the white supremacists owe them this help as an effort to compensate for the injustice that they have practiced against non-white people and to help compensate for the benefits that racists receive as a result of the practice. I've heard a lot of victims of white supremacy who have said that, you know, they don't want to ask white people for anything and, you know, that just a lot of reasons as to why they do not want to do that. They don't think it's constructive. Uh, I have asked many white people for things and I have gotten constructive results. I got a phone recently. Um, I've asked a admitted racist and he got the phone, mailed it out and everything. Um, so I can, hey, <laughs> I have evidence. You can ask racists for constructive things and you might get it. Uh, that doesn't change my perception. I, this is a admitted racist. I'm suspicious of this person still, but I think you can sometimes get constructive resources. Um, why do you say that, you know, non-white people uh, should not hesitate to ask white people or white supremacists for help? Because we're, we're asking for justice. We're asking for people, all people, to produce justice. Nobody's producing justice. The white supremacists are certainly not producing justice, and the victims are not producing justice. So any person who encounters anybody should always, either directly or indirectly, be talking about, you know what, regardless of how anybody feels about anybody, everybody is supposed to be trying to produce a world in which no one is mistreated, and the person who needs help the most gets the most constructive help. If there's a tornado coming through and you happen to see someone in a wheelchair trying to get away from the tornado, trying to get into a cellar somewhere or, or, or into a bunker somewhere, I mean a, a shelter that's designed to resist tornadoes and they're having trouble getting the wheelchair up over the curb and whatnot and the person is a person that you don't know and never seen before and all like that, but that person is being presented to you you give that person help, whether the person is white or non-white, because you don't know everything. But you do know that you're supposed to be in the business of trying to improve this wonderful planet and everything on it that has been given to all of us. It's a gift. So I have very breath the universal prayer, which is I call breathing. I mean, uh, you can make a universal prayer out of that. Uh, that's listed in the uh, Word Guide, too. Uh, tells you, through logic, that this is the way to go. Now, you can choose other ways to go, but then you ask yourself, is this the most constructive way? Because codification is about doing the most constructive thing. So you have to person, because you assume one thing that's for sure. You don't know everything. And then might bring about some kind of change in the person. The person may, may even resent your help, may even call your name after you have saved them by getting them into the shelter. And then at some point, after they are all hunkered down and whatnot, and the tornado is blown over, they might say, I still don't like you people. It might be a white person talking to a black person. Yeah, you helped me, but I still don't like you. I never will, never have, never will. And I accepted your help because I needed your help. But I'll never help you do anything. You can guarantee that. 
and the person might actually tell you these things. But you say, well, I'm going to still do my best to try to qualify for universal man or, in the case of a female, universal woman. And these are the things that I've outlined to help meet those qualifications simply because, you know, you may not like me, but I'm not supposed to be bothered about that. I'm supposed to be doing what I am supposed to be doing according to counter-racist logic and according to compensatory logic and according to universal law. And that's using the definition of justice. Help the person present it to you. That person is presented to you. And it's really a question being asked there. There's a tornado coming in about the next 10 minutes. That's the warning signal. And this person can't make it up the curb, and you pass right by them. No, stop. That person is being presented to you because this may be a test. A test presented to you by whom? By whatever made you and whatever put you there at that moment, at that particular place, at that particular time, to see if later on you will be qualified. Not just now, but later on, your mind is in the correct place. Your intentions are correct. Even though the person that you help is dedicated to having the incorrect intentions. But you don't want to be saddled with that. That's the importance of being codified with an objective in mind, of being universal man or universal woman, meaning people who practice justice and correctness in all areas of activity. That's what you should be aiming for, even if you never make it. Most likely you won't, but that doesn't matter at all because that's your assignment according to logic. That's my assignment according to logic. And that's why I made the remarks that I did. Um, wow. <clears throat> I uh, I also wanted to make sure that I, I got in because I've heard uh, I've heard victims saying, you know, the problems that black people face uh, are white people most to blame, uh, are black people to blame, and I've heard you say that uh, your statement uh, either uh, black people are inferior to white people or uh, white people are most to blame for the problems, all of the problems of black people or both. And I just was curious. I've heard you say, you know, black people, uh, we were uh, not practicing justice. There's been no record uh, that justice has been practiced uh, in recorded history. Um, black people were mistreating each other. Non-white people were mistreating each other before the system of white supremacy. Um, do you think black people um, could be inferior to white people, that that's the reason we have not replaced white supremacy with justice? No, I don't believe that. I don't believe any person is inferior to another person because I think the creator know, of people knows what the creator is doing. It's not my judgment call. I don't even get into that argument. But let's say that the white supremacists have definitely said that. But let's say for the sake of argument or the sake of clearing up an argument, eliminating an argument, let's say that one part of that statement is true and this part you know, rather than all parts of uh, all three parts or just two parts or one part of the three of that one statement. Let's say that black people are officially and scientifically and any way you want to look at it, just flat out inferior to white people. Now, that could be true. I don't rule it out, and I'm not afraid of it because, after all, I didn't create anything. So that's not on me. I did not create people. I did not create blades of grass. I did not create superior people or inferior people or people who are equal. I have never created anything. Like I've never even talked to anyone, white or non-white, that ever created anything. So it's not on me anyway. And that's the way non-white people should look at it. But let's just say, for the sake of logical discussion, that it turns out that Many people will just sit around and agree, finally. Let's face it. Black people are inferior to white people. Now, 
I have made a statement. I, I don't fear that conclusion at all for a very logical reason. Why? Because the same objective still applies. Replace white supremacy with justice, which means what? Set up a system that is based on guaranteeing that no person is mistreated and guaranteeing that the person that needs help the most gets the most constructive help. And if that person is classified as inferior, that just means that the person who is not inferior has to help the person who is, just like you would the person who temporarily, in some situations, a person might say, is in a weaker position or an inferior position because that person in that wheelchair trying to make it to the shelter in a tornado, some might, someone might go whizzing by them, a real sprint runner, and say, that person is inferior to me because I'm going to be at the shelter in record time and that person ain't going to be nowhere close to the shelter. And the tornado is bearing down and in about 10 minutes, that person is going to be whirling around in the air, wheelchair and all. Why? Because the person can't run as fast as me. So therefore, I declare that the person is inferior. Now, a lot of people think on that level. All down through history, there are a lot of people who have thought on that level simply by looking at a person and saying, I declare you inferior, or I declare you as being weaker than me. In one reason or another, you can't run as fast as me, or you can't think as fast as me, or you can't fix food as, uh, the way that I can, or you don't know how to build a house, and I do. Therefore, you're an inferior. So people slap labels on other people all the time. People even joking with each other, always, you know, almost all day long, put people down, as they say in an office or in a warehouse. Oh, you can't do this. You can't. You don't know this. Oh, you're dumb. See, this is all measures of telling people somehow you don't measure up, which means you're inferior. But in a system of justice, you don't even think that way. You think the person needs help. All I know is the person needs help, and I'm able to help the person. There will come a day when somebody will have to help me. So you keep that in mind. Keep that in mind while you're walking around pounding yourself on the chest, talking about you know everything and you can do everything. Keep that in mind. There will come a day if you stay here long enough where somebody will have to help you. They might have to help you in a wheelchair during a tornado. Just stay here long enough. So... The whole concept of whether a black person is inferior to white people or whether white people are inferior to black people, throw that nonsense out of your mind, period. Talk about justice. Think about justice. Work for justice, regardless of what the other person is saying. That's counter-racist logic. That's compensatory logic. That's logic standing in alone. Here, here. I I had heard you say that before, but it was uh it was fantastic to hear it again, just to be reminded, don't ever get into those arguments of trying to uh prove to someone that you're not inferior. Uh so what if I am? Should I be mistreated even if I am inferior Absolutely. to you? Now you got it. Hey, <laughs> just because I'm inferior just because I can't measure up to whatever your so-called standards are, does that mean that I'm automatically on a list to be mistreated? No. <laughs> That's incorrect thinking by any measure. And we don't want anybody in charge of anything who thinks like that. That's inferior thinking. Mm. According to what? According to how what thinking should be. That's what. Uh, if it's uh, okay with you, uh, some folks called in. I was going to see if they had any questions, Mr. Fuller. Yes, sir. Go right ahead. Okay. 
Uh, I see uh, Pam, co-author of uh, Trojan Horse, and the new book uh, on the line. Pam, did you have a question for Mr. Fuller? Uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Fuller, Gus, and, and Justice. Uh, I didn't have any questions. I'm just listening, and uh, I'm really enjoying it. And I love that last thing that you said about even if I am inferior, does that mean I'm supposed to be mistreated? And I, I think that's just an excellent question. So I, I'm still listening, so yes. I'll um, enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you. Always good to hear from Pam. Uh, person that dialed in uh, from Texas, uh, did you have a question for Mr. Fuller? Person that dialed in from Texas, did you have a question? Okay. I'll go two at a time. Let's see. Person that dialed in uh, from California uh, and the person that dialed in from Virginia, did either of you two have a question? No, I'm just listening. Thank you. Mm-hmm. I am not audible. Yes, sir. Um, I just wanted to say it's an uh, honor to hear a very good work. A lot of clarity for me, you know, my short years here. I'm still learning. Um, I just have one quick question. Could you speak um, up, was, sir? I'm sorry. Could you speak up? Sorry. Sorry. Sorry about that. I was just curious to know, um, Mr. Fuller, if you have any plans of having a biography written? No, no. <laughs> In fact, I uh, the the work that I do, I like for people to center on problem solving, because I, you know, the the whole philosophy is not to build up icons. Uh, uh, I al- always use the term, or frequently use the term, follow the logic. Logic came with the universe. This is really a mathematical problem. Some people say it's a spiritual problem and all like that, but spirit is a part of mathematics. Everything is mathematics, meaning cause and effect. So you want to always do the most constructive thing. You can do a non-constructive thing or you can do the constructive thing. So it's not the person. A person is just a conduit for the activity. I mean, like a wire. The wire is a conduit or the wire carries electricity from one place to another. That's what a person is supposed to be doing. That's why a person is issued hands, fingers, arms, some pretty first-class equipment by whatever created the universe. That's what a person is, just a part of the equipment that goes with the universe. So a person should always look upon him or herself, not as holier than thou, but that royal idea, I mean, that eventually culminated in the establishment of racism, you know, which is a holier than thou position. But just use what you have to do the best you can. I think Thurgood Marshall, in fact, uh, when I heard these words, Thurgood Marshall was once asked, uh, how did he want to be remembered? And he said, well, I did the best that I could with what I had. And I think that should say it all for most people. You came here in the universe, you're given a brain, you're given a place to be because everybody is somewhere. You probably don't like the place where you were born or something like that, and you moved to another place and you didn't like that either. But you're just moving around. We're just organisms moving around from place to place, doing stuff once we're here. Because once you're here, you got one option, and that is to stay here and try to do something. Or you can check out. That's one thing you can do. You can kill yourself and be gone at any time. Now, you can do that. That's a guarantee. you got a guarantee on that. Or you can try to do something useful. Or you can do something uh, usefully constructive, that is. Or you can spend your time trying to cook up ways to be non-constructive, trying to do harm to people. But you are here. So the logic says, use your time constructively. Why not? since it's all a gift anyway. And you do that as long as you can, in the, under whatever circumstances you happen to be given. Now, some people are given very, very comfortable circumstances. And many, many people are given very uncomfortable circumstances. But whether it's comfortable or whether it's non-comfortable, 
you to use the circumstances, <clears throat> excuse me, the circumstances that you have to the best of your ability to do something constructive. Everything that you do, everything that you think is going to be in the constructive column or the non-constructive column. And one thing that black people can do that's constructive is get away from all traditions that we call black traditions or the black culture that by giving them a real test, we find out that they are not constructive. Get rid of those cultural conditions. Stop being wedded to something just because somebody said that that's what we've been doing a long time. You can be doing the incorrect thing for a long time. Get rid of a lot of habits that have been formed for a long time and became a part of what is called a culture. Because culture is whatever you're doing at the time that you're doing it. If you're robbing a delicatessen, that's your culture. If it's a black person doing it, robbing the delicatessen, that's black culture for that black person because that's the person that's doing it. If a person is sitting on a bench reading a book and the person is black and are non-white, that's the culture of that person reading that book at that particular moment. That's what culture is. All culture is a matter of doing whatever it is you are doing at the time that you are doing it. That's all it ever has been, all it ever will be. That's all it is right this moment. Whatever you're doing at this moment is a part of your culture. The minute that you stop doing it, like I'm on a telephone, a hookup, the minute I hang up the telephone, I'm no longer a part of the telephone culture. Right now, because I am on a telephone, I'm a part of the telephone culture. If I'm looking at a clock trying to figure out what time it is, I'm in the culture of looking at a clock trying to figure out what time it is by looking at the clock. So I'm in the mode of a clock culture. The minute I take my eyes off the clock and start thinking about or doing something else, I'm no longer in the clock culture. That's the way that works. But the white supremacists believe in telling people Things like you can go overseas and dig in the desert and find your culture. Yeah, you can find the culture that you're overseas digging in the desert looking for your culture. That's your culture right at that moment. But your culture is not there in the desert except you are there in the desert looking for your culture. That's the only part of your culture. Say, oh, no, well, we're looking for what people did thousands of years ago. That was thousands of years ago when that was their culture and that's what they were doing at the time. Now, what's the value of knowing that? The value of knowing that is you don't go just chasing around trying to put your value on what somebody was doing, like crossing a river in a canoe 8,000 years ago and say that that was you crossing that river in a canoe 8,000 years ago because it wasn't. Not unless you really know that that was you 8,000 years ago. Sometimes people ask me, what is my history? And I give a codified answer, and it's a truthful one because you always stick with the truth because the race is always known when you're not telling the truth because they are masters of saying things that are not true. So they always know when you're not telling the truth. You cannot fool them. So if someone asks me, what is my history? I say, my history, meaning my story, is everything that ever happened before the beginning of time and since. And when I make that statement, I am telling the truth. That's something I'm sure of. That's not guessing. That's not anything that I read in a book. That's anything that I have to go and check with somebody to find out if I read the correct book. Logic tells me that. The logic that came with the universe. My history can't be anything other than that. Everything that ever happened before the beginning of time and since is my history. 
Now, a person might say, oh, well, now that you think about it, that's everybody's history. And your response to that is, so? Because what we're really talking about is not history. We're talking about what we're supposed to be doing this very minute. And that is producing products that should be produced, like justice. And it has nothing to do with somebody, what somebody did or didn't do 80 trillion years ago. But it has to do with you right this minute. And you don't have to look over your shoulder to try to find out what somebody else is doing who is long since dead. You look at the problem that is presented to you just like the people did 80 trillion years ago. They came to cross the desert sand maybe and they saw a river and they figure we can't walk the water so we have to make something that will get us from this area where the sand is to that other area where the orchard is and that's across the water so what can we do so somebody says well we got to make something that'll get us across the water we do see some things in the water that will float we see pieces of trees and wood well maybe we can put two or three trees together and since we see the trees float some of them Maybe we can get across the river that way. So they made what you might call a raft, and they got across the river. Now, eight million years later, there might not even be a river there. But you have many people who have been taught by the white supremacists, of course, many black people, oh, you have to go somewhere and find some desert sand and then imagine that there is a river there and then try to make a boat to get across that sand that is no longer a river because this is eight million years later and that's not logical there's no river there you don't need a boat but the white supremacists act, have a lot of black people acting like that there is something there when that something has changed over time. You adapt to the conditions. That's the message being sent. Not everybody is born at the same time and dies at the same time and have the same problems at the same time, minute by minute, every day, wherever they happen to be. They might have variations of a problem, like the whole world might be flooded but in some places, there might be places like high ground. So you don't act like there's not high ground. You head for the high ground that's out of the water. But where there is no high ground, you might have to find something that will float. That's a different circumstance. And whatever those circumstances are, that's your culture at that moment. And it's very important to remember, in order to be what? In order to be logical because logic came with the universe. You solve the problem that is right in front of you. Don't try to solve the problem that confronted somebody 8 million years ago. You weren't even there. You don't even know what the problems were. But you're searching for them. You don't need to search for a problem. The problem you need to solve is right in front of you. That's why you were put there, and that's why the problem was put there. That's the logical deduction under compensatory logic. Uh, non mighty wick, non mighty wick. Uh, if you have questions for Mr. Fuller, uh, your line should be open. Uh, let's see. Uh, non mighty wick. Did you have uh, questions for Mr. Fuller? Yes, sir. Can I be heard? Yes, sir. Okay, great. Hello, uh, Mr. Fuller. Thanks for coming on. Um, I wanted to. Uh, extend on the example you um, you were talking about earlier and then just just uh, get your view to see if it'll be the same or if your view would change but you were talking about um it was um a, a white female you know it was a storm going on and whatnot and um uh, so same white female same same um wheelchair 
And I guess the only difference is that she, uh, you know, is is known because um, you know, you, somehow you got information that she uh, engages in sex with non-white people. You know, so she commits maximum racist aggression. Um, you know, do you still, uh, you know, does does your views uh, stay the same or any changes? Thank you. Yes, but I'm not singling out any particular uh, uh, white lady. I mean, uh, and I do call them ladies. I call all uh, females ladies because that's what they are or should be or that's what they should be called. And uh, for whatever that means, I try to be as courteous and polite as I can. And uh, that's the white or non-white. But the point that I make, like I make in the book, I've written in the book, that was written many years ago, and it still holds up. I still uh, say that, that under the system of white supremacy, sexual intercourse between white and non-white, and that includes people that we know, many of us, I mean, and it's a growing thing. Many of us know people personally, and we, many of us have family members, quote, unquote, that that's what we call them, I mean, who are white who have so-called, quote, unquote, married into the family and all like that. But it is racist aggression under the system of white supremacy. I mean, it's not personal. It's business. And the way the business of counter-racism works, the mathematical equation is, it's equivalent to a person in the position of a warden having sexual intercourse with a prisoner. Now, the prisoner is, is at a disadvantage. There are some people who have been in prisons and all like that. There are some people who have worked in prisons. There are some people, I mean, probably, I mean, who are listening to me, who have worked as guards in prisons or know someone who has, who has, quote, unquote, taken advantage of a person sexually, like a male who is a guard and says, I can get you some more food if you'll have sexual intercourse with me or I'll give you special privileges out in the yard. And the female says, well, I'm going crazy in here. I mean, you know, if you can get me about three or four more hours on Sunday out in the yard and whatnot where I can get some fresh air and whatnot and some better food and whatnot, then she agrees to it. But that's not what should be done. That's taking advantage of a person because they have a weaker position. And you don't take advantage of weak people. You help people in a weakened position. That's the logic. So as long as we have a system of white supremacy in place worldwide, for a white person to go so far to satisfy themselves, because, you know, that's what they're basically doing, to satisfy their own needs or wants, they go so far as to have sexual intercourse with a person who is at a disadvantage. And that's whether the person is male or female. It doesn't matter. It's a male person who a white female, I mean, says, hey, I, I want to be with you. I have sex drive for you. I want you to satisfy my sex drive. Or if it's the reverse, the male person says he wants his sex drive satisfied by the white person. It's still the same as more or less the sexual urges of a child going to what we call a grown-up person and saying, I want to have sex with you. Or the grown-up person telling the child, I want to have sex with you. And they actually do so. Now, it shouldn't be done. Why? Because it's not an equal situation. Sexual intercourse is between equals. It should be reserved between people who one person has just as much power as the other. Otherwise, what you have is, at very least, a molestation situation, or you have what they classically classically call rape, because one person is taking unjust advantage of another. It's not equal. We're not in a world of equality between people who are white and non-white. And that's the reason for that. And that's still holding true. It doesn't make any difference whether the people declare that they're in love with each other and, 
I mean, there's never been a love or never will be a love, I mean, so binding, so true, so functional. Uh, they get along marvelously and all like that. They are not doing it in the correct environment. The white supremacist environment is not conducive to that type of activity. That's the logic of it. It will be a much better situation if everybody's equal. And that's what the two people who want to do this should be striving for. Put that on hold until racism no longer exists, been replaced with the system of justice, and then everybody can jump in bed and have a grand old time. How about them apples? <laughs> All right, um, thank you, Mr. Fuller. Right, okay, so just so I'm clear, so say if it's you know the prison warden, um, and then you know this this prison warden this prison warden has been committing maximum racist aggression against the prisoners, and then uh, somehow or another you know he ends up to where he uh, is uh, ends up in a wheelchair, you know, and then uh, a fire break out up in the prison. And, uh, you know, the warden is somehow trapped, you know, and he's, he's looking like he's trying to get to safety and whatnot. And, you know, uh, would your view be, you know, for the victims uh, at some point in time, if, if they could, to uh, assist the warden to safety? Yes, as long as, but you also point out, so you point out the crimes as they happen. I mean, you know. You, 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 you let the world know. That's why I say that all of this secret stuff should stop. People should stand up and say what they have done that might be of harm to someone, everybody, you know. And it's not a reconciliation thing. It's a, it's a part of the justice package. See, what the white supremacists want, like they've always wanted, like the slave masters and whatnot that took advantage of the slaves, I mean, sexually and otherwise and whatnot, they want it. Everybody to walk around acting like it's not happening. When all the, we need really need to do is just say, oh, yes, we're doing it. But it's something that shouldn't be done. But we have to admit, we have to tell the truth that we're doing it. We're doing something that shouldn't be done. Just like everybody kind of, well, I won't say everybody, but I've heard stories and I kind of halfway agree with it, I'm, you know, whatever that means, uh, of the, uh, the town drunk. Now, the town drunk staggers around, he's drinking, but he lets everybody know, I'm a drunk. I shouldn't be drinking. I know that this whiskey is not good for me. It's destroying my liver. It's destroying me. It destroyed my family. I don't treat people correctly when I'm drinking. But I love to drink, and I guess I'll always love to drink. But I'm a dangerous person when I get drunk. So try to help me by staying out of my way if you see me coming, because I might do anything when I'm drunk. Now, the person may not change, but the first step, according to compensatory logic, in solving any problem is to tell the truth about the problem. And don't try to hide it like the white supremacists are experts in doing Racism running rampart all over the place. And they'll say, racism, where? Or they'll say, who, me? No way. And they're not telling the truth. And that is very hurtful to anything that's going to lead to what you need to produce a product called justice and correctness. You've got to have truth to start with. No matter whose feelings, it hurts. Like the town drunk. Now, the fellow who is really dangerous is the fellow who says, give me the car keys, I ain't drunk. And the person can hardly stand up. And can't find one key from the other. But your case is going to be harder dealing with that person. That person is more dangerous because a person will not admit the truth. Everybody has flaws. And that's one of the problems with all male-female interaction between non-white people themselves. It's that people will not admit their flaws. But 
you know, and that's a natural reaction. People don't like to admit their flaws, but we got to do what we don't like. See, well, I'm this way, just like the town drunk. I'm this way, I may not even change, but this is the way I am. What you see is what you get. The world would be a better place if we could just get that far. But oh no, the white supremacists teach you, hey, I'm perfect. I'm not this, I'm not that. I don't have that intention. I don't have this intention. And they teach non-white people to do the same thing, to be just as false and phony and hypocritical as we can be in every area of activity, economics, religion, sex, you name it. And that's got to stop. Because the first ingredient you need, if you're going to have universal man, universal woman, white and non-white, doing the correct thing in the universe, carrying out the assignment that we should be all doing, eliminate racism, become universal man, universal woman. Should be based on truth, justice, and correctness. Thank you, sir. Now, if there's no more questions, I might ask answer one more, and then... I have to curtail oh, no worries. this interaction. No worries, Mr. Fuller. Um, Dark Matter, uh, she's a black male in the U.K. Uh, she's been a guest on the program. Uh, she emailed a question. Um, she wanted to know, uh, she said that she once heard you say that the system of white supremacy is losing its power. Uh, her question is, uh, do you still believe this to be the case, and if so, why? And if not, why not? Uh, I ask this because of the recent developments in the so-called Middle East uprisings. I am confused as to whether this is an example of non-white people seeking to produce justice, or is this another example of the system of white supremacy's expansion and refinement? Uh, but her question, uh, do you believe the system of white supremacy is losing its power? Why and or why not? Yes, and both things are happening at the same time. The white supremacists are trying to refine the system, trying to keep it together like they always have been doing. And the victims of white supremacy are in a very ragged way, and it's pretty ragged, begin to put the pieces together of what's going on. They're becoming smarter. I usually give an illustration of it's three steps forward, two steps back, with a net gain of one step. That's how I describe the situation with the victims of racism in regards to racism. Three steps forward, two steps back, with a net gain of one step. Now, it looks like you're losing ground when that happens. If you picture a person taking three steps forward and then step back two steps, you kind of say, well, that's, that's kind of sad, and it is. But you keep in mind you made at least one step. Your net gain was one step out of the three steps made. You went back with two steps, and that's basically what non-white people have been doing ever since the beginning of the system of white supremacy. Sometimes maybe a fraction of a step uh, forward as a net gain. But now they're taking a, you know, just about a whole step. But it's a lot of steps on this, what I call, what the code book calls, the word guide calls the longest journey. And it's a lot of steps, and you only know how many steps are in that whole scenario when you've taken that last step and you don't know what that is. That's the X factor in algebra, as you might say. Trying to find the value of X. Trying to find what a world of justice is actually like. You won't know it till you get it. Because we've never been there. There is such a thing as having never been to a place. Never arrived at a place. But you do know when you get to that place that you have arrived. Why? Because you have arrived. That's why. And that's just a simple formula. A person asks you about a place that you have never been, you just simply say, I don't know. That's why I'm trying to get there. 
So I'll find out what it's like. And you can't really answer the, what the place is like until you actually get there. Experience. So we want to experience a world of justice. We've never been there. But you keep reaching for it and trying to produce it, rather. Because that is the process. It's not a place that you go to. It's a function that you achieve. And I think that you achieve it through codification. The racists have a code in maintaining racism. What is needed is a code of thought, speech, and action that will erase the system of racism, erode it, take it apart, dismantle it, and replace it with a better system. And a better system for racism would, logically speaking, be a system of justice, a system that guarantees that no person is mistreated and guarantees that the person that gets help gets the most help. The person that needs the most help gets the most help, the most constructive help. That is the antidote to the system of white supremacy, which is designed to guarantee that the person that needs help the most won't get it, and that people are mistreated on the basis of color. That's what it's designed to do. Um, Mr. Fuller, if it's okay, uh, Justice, my co-host, she had a request if she could ask you a final question before you depart. Okay. Justice? Um, um, I, uh, yeah, I have one more quick question. Um, I have a, a big test, um, I have a big test coming up, and, uh, I would like to, to know what to do if a non-white person or a white person is mistreating me. And, uh, mm -hmm. can you please, ex can you please, um, give me some suggestions of how to prevent of what he or she is doing to me? Well, it depends on the nature of the mistreatment. If it's, if it's some type of verbal mistreatment, meaning they are using words in such a way that the result is uh, that you are being mistreated or someone is being mistreated, you start by using words, and the words that you use are in the form of a question. Everything in the universe starts with a question. So you just simply say, what are you doing, and why are you doing it? You start with questions like that. And what is going to be the result of what you're doing? And then you ask the real clincher questions, you might say. Now, as a result of what you are doing or what others are doing or what I'm doing, is it going to have a constructive result? And then you ask another question. If it is constructive, how? And then have them demonstrate what the result is going to be. That's how you ascertain whether or not there's mistreatment being done. See, it's best not to make accusations ever. You don't accuse anybody of anything. That, that makes the, the whole situation hostile, more hostile than it was before. It's best to raise a question. You know, is this a form of mistreatment? See, you can ask that question. And just don't ask just one question. Ask a series of questions because until you find they have the answer, Ask the final question. Now, how do you know when it's the final question? When the problem is solved. That's when you know there's the final question. Because there is a final, there is an answer to every question. Whether the answer is going to wind up with a non-constructive result or a constructive result. It's going to be one in one of one of two categories: constructive or non-constructive, but you always start with a question until, and then another question, and another question, and a question, and an answer, and another question, and an answer, and another question, and an answer, until you finally reach the final question. And like I said, you don't know what the final question is until you get that final answer, and that answer is the most constructive answer to the original question or any of the questions in between. That's how you measure it. You don't know what the final answer is going to be until you get there. But you keep asking, okay. how is this constructive? The way that you are talking to me, is this the way that everybody should be talked to at all times and all circumstances? Well, why are you singling me out to talk to me in this fashion? So you're not accusing anybody of anything. You're just asking questions. 
Why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? Why are you putting more work on my desk than you put on the other person's desk? Might be a reason. And the person might say, well, the other person is handicapped. The other person can only use one arm. So I thought that you might kind of help out. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. See, now you're getting explanations. By what? By asking questions. Or sometimes a person might say, none of your business. Then you ask a question about that. Well, why is it none of my business? And let them answer. Um, if you get in the habit of doing that, if you get in the habit of doing that, the questions will always come to you. And then not only that, it's something about the nature of a question. When you raise a question, even to yourself, the answer to that question somewhere out there in the universe starts gravitating towards you. Why? Because the way it works, logically speaking, is that how, that's how questions are answered. That's what scientists do. They start out knowing nothing except to ask the question. And somewhere out there, that answer moves from where it is toward sometimes fast, sometimes slowly, the person that raised the question. Instinctively, babies understand that because they come into the world asking questions. When they cry out, they're actually asking, what in the world is going on here? That's why they're crying. They know something. They instinctively sense that something is out of order. And later on, they find out that everything is out of order. And so they were right on point when they came here crying instead of laughing. Why do I say that? Because it's logical. That's why. Why do babies cry instead of laugh, laugh when they're born? They could come here laughing, but they cry because something, something that goes way beyond their brains, something in what we call their soul, tells them, this is a mess out here, and I'm in the middle of it. So if the baby's assignment is to help straighten out the mess, that's the logic. Thank you, Mr. Fuller. Um, I uh, really appreciate uh, you being on this program for the 13th visit, and um, I hope we can uh, have you back on for uh, the 14th visit. Yes, ma'am. And bye. And I appreciate being invited. Thank you very much, and... Good night. Have a good evening, Mr. Fuller. Yes, sir. Con- context of white supremacy. Uh, always a pleasure to have Mr. Fuller on the program. Uh, I will link uh, this program at Blog Talk um, so people can download and listen to the full broadcast. Uh, When I do that, I'll also include the link so that you can get your copy of the code book or the word guide, um, yeah, I'll make sure that that's uh, included in the description for the program. But uh, yeah, always, always great to hear from uh, to hear from Mr. Fuller. Um, see, Justice, do you have a uh, do you have a uh, a news report for us? Yes, I do. Um, this news rep- this news uh, report was from RacismDaily dot com. And it was published on April twenty uh, ninth of this year, and the title is well. Uh, guess have you read this one on the program? Um, call um, wait. Uh, call away. Uh, Comity member compares black city clerk to Aunt Jer- Jerema at uh, her to make pancakes. Have you read that one? I have. I have not read that one. Uh, I think, uh, at least, I'm not, I can be uh, mistaken, but I think the correct pronunciation is Aunt Jemima, um, the the person that he was comparing the black female to, Aunt Jemima, I think is the correct, correct pronunciation. All right, thanks. 
Um, John, well, and um, below the title, there is a um, picture of a white person. Um, I suspect he is a racist. Um, I, I read some of it, and it um, it's very interesting. John Ma- Malon, uh, a member of the Callaway Citizen Ad- Ad- Advisory Board in Callaway, Florida, has stirred up con has stirred up controversy with what some see as a racial slur directed at a city employee. Emily Franklin, the assistant to Callaway's finance director, claims Malone recently told her she looked like Aunt Jemima and asked her what the, what the, when the pancakes would be ready. Franklin, an African-American woman who claims she's faced discrimination throughout her life, thought it was in her past. I'm I'm just thinking this day and age that things would change and you don't have to listen to things like this, especially on your job to your face, Franklin said. Franklin sent Malone a letter warning him of the city's non-discrimination, po- non-discrimination policy and the city's legal ob- obligation to protect employees from race-based harassment. The letter warns Malone against making race-based comments in the future. Malone says he tried to apologize to Franklin Wednesday. I want to apologize that she took my general conversation and it was misinterpreted by by her. Nothing I can do about that. I'm sorry, Malone said. If if I thought he had a sincere apology in him, then maybe. Franklin said about accepting an apology, but even Malone admits he doesn't regret what he said, just that it, just that it offended her. Aunt Jemima's not a bad-looking lady. If you look up the pictures of her, of her she's a good-looking lady, Malone said. Malone is a white person. I suspect he is a racist again. City officials gave Franklin permission to refuse to talk to Malone when he tried to deliver his apology yesterday. Um, that was one. That that article was from RacismBilly.com. Um, very interesting story. Um, uh, I think, um, yeah, it's uh, full of racism. That's uh And it's making fun of um Aunt Jemima. Um yeah, a black female. Mm. Yep. I uh I remember I spoke with uh Mr. Fuller like two weeks ago or a week and a half ago or I guess it was two weeks ago maybe. Wow. Anyway, I was talking to Mr. Fuller and I told him about uh the incident in uh Sweden, you know, with the uh, the jungle party and all that and he said that that is that is the culture in which we live. You shouldn't be surprised by that sort of thing. That's what the system of white supremacy is supposed to produce. Uh, that that's the way white people think about black people uh, worldwide. Uh, it should be no surprise when this sort of thing happens. Um, yeah, I think he would say the same thing to this. That's you should expect this sort of thing being compared uh, to Aunt Jemima. You should expect that sort of thing, or Uncle Ben, or you know. Whatever it is, <laughs> like that should not be a surprise at all. And uh, I too suspect that John Malone is a white supremacist. Uh, and I'm just saying suspect, not to name call. That's all. <laughs> I've said very clearly uh, what I think it means to be white in a system of white supremacy. White equals racist. White supremacist. Uh, I think that's true. And we've had you know a host of white people on the program uh, who have you know explained the logic of why that is. Uh, at any rate. Um, Fascinating report. Fascinating report. Um, did you have any other thoughts on this uh, article? Yes. Um, I didn't know that uh, Aunt uh, Jemima was a uh, fake person <laughs> or a character. Um, I would say it's making fun of black people. Yeah. Not her specifically, but making fun of black people. Definitely. And, I mean, white people are doing this constantly. White people um, 
do this sort of thing all the time, uh, making fun of black people uh, in real subtle ways, mocking them. That's I mean, this happens uh, it, it, every day. <laughs> every day uh, is a menstrual show. Uh, in the, the entire system of white supremacy, really, it turns the entire planet uh, into a minstrel show for non-white people. And pretty much, if you're a victim of racism, you're on the stage, unfortunately. Um, that's why, I mean, we just, we got to be on our assignment. Replace white supremacy with justice immediately. Uh, and that was, that was in uh, Invisible Man too, the minstrel and, and the uh, the nigger bank uh, that, yeah, Invisible Man, Ralph Ellison, incredible. Y'all should check that program out from yesterday. Uh, any other thoughts, Justice? Uh oh, Justice, are you still there? Justice? Oh, yeah, my the phone's speaking again. It's irritating. Uh, I'm sorry, what did you say? I asked if you had any other thoughts, anything else you wanted to share about that article or anything else? Oh, um, nope, I don't uh, have anything uh, else to say or any thoughts on the article. Proven. Uh, I'm going to uh, invest in counter racism. I'm going to donate five dollars. I was going to say bucks, but th that's in Ellison too. I was going to say bucks, but uh, someone said I shouldn't say that. I think uh, I'm okay with saying it as long as you know you make sure you keep in context. Now you know white people have used that term to reference black people consistently, and you know what does that mean? Them referencing money dollars as bucks, and them referencing black people, victims of white supremacy as bucks, you know, just keep all that in context, you know, thinking about the words that we're using. But yeah, I'm going to donate $5 to uh, Justice um, via her blog, because I uh, gave the idea about sharing news, because I think that's important. I think, you know, paying attention to racism, paying attention to news, period, information, trying to be informed. Mr. Fuller talked about that uh, when I said, you know, I wanted to do news consistently and have her doing most of it. Uh, she's been pretty Johnny on the spot about uh, having the news reports uh, ready to roll for the program. So I will invest in counter-racism and donate $5 bucks to uh, her account ASAP. Um, you all can do that too. You can go to her blog, justdojusticetoday.blogspot.com. Um, let's see. Oh, I had a news report as well. I had a news report as well because uh, I don't want to just be lazy. Um, that That's going to be another thing <laughs> i get to in a minute. I don't want to be lazy. Uh, white people could do – I mean, you've seen the white people at Blog Talk Radio. Um, white people could do a lot to uh, make our counter – racist efforts, ragged. Uh, they, I mean, they could shut us down, just to be truthful. They could shut us down at any time. Um, so I don't want to be lazy and just rely on racism daily. I want to make sure that I am honing my own skills to research and uh, keep up with the news and racism in the news. So this report is not at RacismDaily.com. This is from uh, MyStateLine.com. Uh, this is an Illinois state news website mystateline.com. Uh, the report is Local Group Stands Up Against Racism. Uh, this was published today, May 2nd. A local group hopes Rockford will stand against racism. A northern Illinois group is reaching out to the Rockford community to stand against discrimination. The Northern Illinois Institute for the Healing of Racism held an interactive workshop to educate people on how to overcome prejudice Sunday. The group showed a video called Mirrors of Privilege, making whiteness visible to encourage the city to better itself. This is crucial for the future of Rockford. My hope is that every white person in Rockford and everybody else too sees this video and interacts with people and talks about it said the program director, Harlan Johnson. Johnson says he plans to show the video several other times throughout the year. Uh, I'm going to contact these folks to see if they would be willing to come on the program. Uh, white Privilege Conference, that was a constructive investment of time. Uh, Mirrors of Privilege, if not Mighty Wick is listening, he'll get a good chuckle out of this. Mirrors of Privilege, Shakti Butler produced Mirrors of Privilege, uh, which features 
admitted racist Tim Wise, suspected racist uh, Dr. Peggy McIntosh uh, in the video, Mirrors of Privilege, Making Whiteness uh, Visible. Uh, excuse me. Uh, Mirrors of Privilege, Making Whiteness Visible. Um, really interesting. Uh, I don't know. That video is online. You can check it out. Uh, it's like, I think, an hour long, but you can check it out. Um, yeah, I'm going to contact these folks. The What is it? The They have a long time. Yes, the Northern Illinois Institute for the Healing of Racism. I'm going to see if I can get, uh, get Mr. Harlan Johnson on the program uh, to find out more about what they're doing to work against uh, racism in Illinois. Very interesting. We have a lot of listeners in the state of Illinois. So, yeah, if any of you all know anything about this interactive workshop that they had, uh, I would like to know. I'm, I'm curious as to what went down. Um, with that, I wasn't really going to go to the phone lines, but a lot of people did call in, and I do uh, appreciate the support uh, from everyone uh, dialing in. Mr. Williams, I saw him on the line. Uh, Cree, um, lots of other people on TalkShoe as well. Um, in fact, <laughs> I'm going to stick to my guns. I am not going to the phone lines because there's too many people uh, for me to... Uh, kind of give some folks an opportunity to share their thoughts and then not others. Um, but I, I do see everyone, and thank you all for dialing in. I wish Mr. Fuller uh, could have shared a little bit more of his time so we could have got more questions in. But I'm always really grateful um, to speak with him and to have him on the program and to uh, yeah give an opportunity for people just to hear him share some of the codification um, that he has uh, written. At any rate, we will be back uh, tomorrow. Uh, so showtime will be uh, 8 p.m. Excuse me. <laughs> Recalibrate that. The program will be uh, 11 p.m. Eastern, 10 p.m. Central, 8 p.m. Pacific uh, tomorrow evening uh, because I do <laughs> want to offer a thought or two on uh, my views on whether or not it's constructive to ask uh, white people uh, for constructive assistance. Um, it's just... Uh, Real ironic in a lot of ways. Someone emailed me a video that Gretna Blast did uh, recently uh, about racism, white supremacy, and uh, he mentioned the program. And he was he was a guest on the program in March of 2009. <laughs> I don't know. Out of people listening right now, I would be stunned if anybody can say yes, I heard that program or I heard it, you know, way back when. But yeah, he was on the program. I think he was like the fourth guest on the cows and uh he recently did this video kind of updating what he was what he had been doing he hadn't been doing videos in a while and uh yeah just like days ago uh he mailed me a phone um so yeah i think it's i just i think it's important i think there are a lot of lessons uh, around it in fact the more i thought about it the more i thought wow this is deserving of a show just to talk about this um a lot of things so yeah that'll be tomorrow uh show time it's a little later um, it'll be simulcast, so it'll be Blog Talk Radio uh, and Talk Shoe. Um, Blog Talk will shut down at the 45-minute mark, but uh, it will broadcast there for the first 45 if that means anything to you. Um, and just to let you all know, I'm doing that because since the white people did not follow through, tacky, trashy, terroristic, trifling. Since they didn't follow through, uh, I can still use all of the promotional tools and everything that have been set up there. The alerts, I think the text alerts and email notifications still get sent out. So that's why I'm still using it. So it should be uh, both spots, but it'll definitely be uh, talk show so you can Skype in, call in, but that'll be a hopefully constructive broadcast May 3rd, uh, 11 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Pacific. Um, also wanted to share um, Justice asked me earlier today, she said, since we're supposed to be about helping other victims, uh, why didn't you give uh, 818 uh, the file for Neely Fuller Jr. number seven uh, when he was on the program uh, in January of 2010? And uh, I have several reasons as to why that program is not up uh, on the uh, blog talk site, why it's not in the public uh, register. I have several reasons, but the one uh, that I think is very important um, that I explained to Justice. Uh, Mr. Fuller, in his code book, I think he has the term uh, greatest spectator in reference to non-white people, black people, in terms of not being active, getting out and doing something to oppose, work against 
uh, the white people who practice white supremacy. And I think, I mean, I just, I see that. I see that in myself, that laziness. And I just think there's a need to combat that. So I think it's great to have a small aspect where you might have to actually do some work uh, to find one program out of almost 400. Um, I think that's constructive. And I mean, that's a payoff. Like if you can track it down, bang, you have, you know, number seven, two hour broadcast when Neely Fuller was here, uh, January of 2010. Um, also, um, it's not that difficult to find. Like I actually took some time to, to find it today and uh, I tracked it down. I'll even, I'll even give some help. So I am offering assistance in the scavenger hunt. Um, Neely Fuller Jr. was on the cows for the sixth time, January 7th, 2010. He was on the cows for the eighth time, February 8th, 2010. That would mean broadcast number seven had to be in a very short window that I just gave you. Got to be somewhere in there. All you would have to do is look at some of the sites that have the full archives uh, for the cows, and there are several of those that I've given out many times. Uh, all you would have to do is look in that period. You will find number seven. I'm looking at it right now on a site that I've given out repeatedly. So, you know, I'm offering some assistance, but I'm doing this because I see a uh, just way too much laziness uh, on the not. And I'm not saying anyone, if you have searched, I think uh, 818, she said she had looked. I'm not saying that you specifically are lazy. Not at all. She has done uh, an extraordinary amount of work with the site. She created the site. It talks you. I am definitely uh, not saying that 818 is lazy. Uh, I'm just saying that in general, uh, I see a great deal of laziness uh, in terms of non-white people not using our time and energy in a constructive manner. Um, and I'm trying to combat that. So hopefully uh, people will not be insulted, will not think Gus is uh, treating people incorrectly. But I've given my explanation. That's the reason as to why number seven is not up. And there are other reasons as well, which I won't get into. But that is one of the reasons that's very important. So, uh, yeah, I hope, uh, folks, if you're really interested, I hope people will search. You can find it. I'm looking at it right now. At any rate, we'll be back uh, tomorrow, May 3rd, uh, 11 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Pacific. And I will definitely link so that you can get the form to order your copy of the Word Guide and or the code book from Mr. Fuller. Uh, if you don't have one or both, um, definitely crucial uh, to understanding racism, white supremacy. Thank you all for supporting. Share the program. Put it on Twitter, Facebook, and definitely visit uh, the wish list at Amazon.com. It's under Gusty Renegade. Uh, invest in the cows if you think the program is constructive and replace white supremacy with justice immediately. Uh, we will be back tomorrow. Cows signing out. Thank you.